Welcome to PM Ready, your guide to becoming PMP certified. This lesson is about stakeholder and communications management documents. Part 1. This lesson combines stakeholder and communications documents because they are so interrelated. We start with the stakeholder register, which is created during the initiating process. Then the stakeholder engagement plan and the communications management plan, which are done during the planning phase, and then the actual project communications, which happen during the project executing phase. There are a few things to notice about this list. First of all, you'll notice that it's presented in the order in which these documents are created, which is the order in which we'll cover them. Also, notice that the planning documents are the Stakeholder Engagement Plan and Communications Management Plan. Both of these are part of the Project Management Plan. The other two, the Stakeholder Register and the Project Communications, are project documents that are important but not part of the Project Management Plan. Also notice the naming. Stakeholder Engagement Plan. This is the one plan of this type representing one of the 10 knowledge areas that does not use the word management in its name. It used to, but it doesn't anymore. The name is now Stakeholder Engagement Plan because the word engagement is considered to be more appropriate when you're working with people than managing stakeholders. The stakeholder register is created at the same time as the project charter during the initiating process group. It contains information about the identified stakeholders. Information such as identification information about the stakeholder, assessment information, and stakeholder classification. We will get into each of these in some detail. The first category of information in your stakeholder register is information to identify the stakeholder. Simple things such as their name, their position in the organization, how to contact them, and what their role is expected to be on the project. Then comes the group of assessment information. This comes from stakeholder analysis, which analyzes the stakeholders and their needs, what their major requirements are, their expectations, their attitudes, which are their levels of support for the project, whether they support the project or not, and how much. It also includes information about their interest in the project. Their risk tolerance is an important factor to consider. Their expectations about what will come of this project and how it will affect them. Their communication preferences. This is an important connection between stakeholders, and communications management. Each stakeholder will have different preferences regarding communication. Some will respond better to email. Some will respond better to text messages or phone calls or face-to-face -face meetings. Those communication preferences should be recorded here in the stakeholder register. Stakeholders may also have certain legal or moral rights, such as occupational health and safety, rights that are protected by legislation, or rights to protect historical sites or the environment. Stakeholders may also have ownership. A person or group may have actual legal title to an asset or a piece of property, something that is related to or needed by the project or affected by the project. Different stakeholders will have different knowledge that can be useful for the project, specialist knowledge that can benefit the project and help in the effective delivery of the project, as well as knowledge of the different politics and power structures within the organization. Any of your stakeholders that are experts in a certain field that may be of use to the project are people that you should consult when it comes to seeking expert judgment on the project. This is a good place to record this information. Here in the stakeholder register, you should also record information about the contribution that individual stakeholders can make to the project. 
whether it's funding or team members or physical assets and other resources or providing support for the project in meeting with others within the organization and helping to be an advocate for the project or a champion of the project's outcomes. It can also be helpful in understanding how to navigate the organization's politics. Assessment information will also include the stakeholder's potential for influencing the project outcomes and how the project is managed and executed, as well as at what phase of the project in its life cycle that stakeholder could have the most influence or impact. The stakeholder register should also include some classifications of the stakeholders. Stakeholders can be classified as either internal or external, which means internal or external to the organization. Also, they can be categorized based on their directions of influence, upward, downward, outward, or sideward. Stakeholder analysis can take a look at the impact, influence, and power and interest of different stakeholders and map these out on grids, in stakeholder cubes, in salience models, and then prioritize these stakeholders based on those that need the most attention from you as a project manager. We'll go over some of the details of these different types of classification in the following slides. The Stakeholder Engagement Assessment Matrix is a simple but useful and practical tool for analyzing the stakeholders. It's used to show whether the stakeholders are unaware of the project, resistant to it, neutral to it, supportive of it, or leading it. And it shows the gap between their current level of engagement and the level of engagement you would like them to have or the desired level of engagement. This tool, by the way, is used in both stakeholder engagement, and communications management processes. As you look at this stakeholder engagement assessment matrix, notice that stakeholder one is currently unaware of the project, but you'd like them to be supportive. Stakeholder two is currently neutral, but you'd like them to be supportive. Stakeholder three is in a better position in that you want them to be supportive and that's right where they are now. This table doesn't currently show anyone as being resistant to the project. This is actually not very realistic. You'll very likely have at least some stakeholders that are somewhat resistant to the project, especially at the beginning. For those stakeholders who are neutral, well, you'll probably want to keep an eye on them because this will probably change during the course of the project. The more they learn about it, they will probably make a decision one way or the other, whether they're more resistant to it or more supportive of it. Is there ever a time in which you might want a stakeholder to be unaware of a project? It's not common, but there are some cases in which you do. In a simple example, you may be organizing a surprise party, and one of the key stakeholders is the person you want to surprise, and you, of course, want them to be unaware. And you may want to specifically call out here in your management of this project that this person needs to be kept unaware of the project. Or you may be working on some government projects that require some compartmentalization of information, in which case you may want to specifically identify stakeholders or stakeholder groups that should be kept unaware of this project, at least for the time being, and maybe longer. There are also cases in international relations where there are people who are or will be affected by the project, but who you don't want to be aware of it, not yet. However, most of the time, you'll want to have stakeholders that are supportive, as well as a small number of people leading the project, a single person as, a, as the project sponsor, or perhaps a committee or board. I often like to use a little bit different format for the stakeholder engagement assessment matrix. Oftentimes, I'll use a spreadsheet in which I record the name of the stakeholder, and in separate columns record their current level of involvement and the desired level of involvement. And I record these as either high, medium, or low. You can pick whatever range is comfortable for you. It could be just high and low. 
Then in another column that I have labeled gap, I have a formula that compares the level of involvement currently to the desired level of involvement and identifies that gap by highlighting that particular cell in the spreadsheet and also putting in the letter of the level of involvement I would like them to have. This is all done with a few simple formulas and some conditional formatting rules to get the color coding. Now you can put this together however you want, but the concept is the same. You want to identify their current and desired levels of involvement and identify any gaps that need to be addressed. Now what about these directions of influence? The directions are measured relative to you as the project manager. The upper direction is everyone who is above you in the organization, senior management, in other words. Downward from you is everyone on the project team. Outward are those stakeholder groups and suppliers, including government, the public, and end users that are stakeholders affected by the project. And then sideward are those stakeholders that are your peers, other project managers and other functional managers. These sideward stakeholders are important not only because they can provide you with valuable insights and information and help on the project and resources, but also because they can compete for the scarce project resources that you need for your project. Another common classification technique is known as the stakeholder classification grid. There are several different forms of grid. A few are the power interest grid, the power influence grid, and the impact influence grid. These are grids that show two axes and measure the stakeholder's level of power, influence, or interest, etc., and map them in these grids. Power is the level of authority or official power that they have within the organization. Interest is the level of concern that they have about the project's outcomes. Influence is the ability for them to influence the outcomes of the project and what they should be. And impact is a little bit different in that it is the ability to cause changes to how the project is planned or executed. Here's an example of one such grid. This is the power interest grid. Here you can see along one axis it shows high power and low power, and on the other low interest and high interest. And here in this grid we have four different quadrants, and for each of these quadrants we have different ways that we should manage these stakeholders. Specifically, if you have a stakeholder who is very powerful in the organization but has very little interest in the project, because of that high power, you need to make sure you keep them satisfied. If, on the other hand, this high power person also has a high interest in the project, you need to be working very closely with them and managing their engagement and involvement in the project very closely. On the other hand, if you have someone who is very interested in the project but doesn't have a lot of power in the organization, it would be wise to keep them informed since they're so interested. Then, for people who have a little power in the organization and very little interest in the project, just keep an eye on them. That's why that one's called Monitor. These types of grids are simple two-dimensional grids. We can use power interest, power and influence, impact and influence, or any combination of these. It's a simple model very useful for smaller projects or projects that have relatively simple relationships. Again, I have my own way of doing this. I tend to use a spreadsheet and for each of these stakeholders, I record their power and interest and then use a simple formula to determine what my strategy should be for managing the engagement of these stakeholders based on their power and interest. I could also use some conditional formatting rules for color coding if I needed to identify certain, certain ones and match the color coding of the grid. For example, if I wanted to keep managed closely highlighted in red, we could use some conditional formatting for that. Again, you can use 
whatever works for you, but I find this to be useful. And then there's the stakeholder cube, which is a 3D version of this concept of grids. This one maps power, interest, and attitude against each other for each stakeholder. Power is defined as those who are influential versus those who are insignificant. Interest has the range of people that are actively interested or passively interested. And attitude is either someone who is a backer or supporter of the project or a blocker or someone who is resistant to or against the project. Mapping these three dimensions into a cube results in eight different combinations of stakeholders that each have their own name and strategy for engaging them. The first is called the savior. This is someone that you manage closely. There's someone who is influential, actively interested, and a backer of the project. This is similar to the person who was high power and high interest on a power interest grid. This is someone you need to pay attention to and do whatever is necessary to keep them on your side. Then you have the friend who is actively interested and supportive of the project, but doesn't have a lot of power in the organization. This is someone that you should consider consulting with, using them as a confidant or sounding board. Then you have the saboteur. The person who is very influential, high power in the organization, actively interested, and a blocker of the project. This is also someone you need to manage closely. You need to make sure that you engage with them in order to try and keep them from causing trouble, and if necessary, clean up after the damage they may cause to the project. Ideally, you can work closely with them and help them to be a supporter or savior of the project rather than a saboteur. Then there is the stakeholder that's categorized as an irritant, someone who is not high power but actively interested in the project and really doesn't like the project as a blocker. This is someone that you need to consult with because they don't have a lot of power in the organization. Hopefully they won't be able to do much damage to the project, but you need to, to be engaged with them so that you can make sure that you manage their influence on the project and the influence that they may have on other stakeholders. Then you have the sleeping giant, someone that you should keep satisfied, and you need to engage with them in order to make them aware of the project. This is someone who is influential, but passive about the project, but could be a powerful backer if they were active. Then you have the acquaintance, someone you should keep informed and communicate with them and make sure that they're aware of the project and what, what's going on. This is someone who doesn't have a lot of power in the organization, isn't very interested, but is a backer of the project. Then you have the time bomb, someone you need to manage closely. Again, because they're so influential and they're currently passive about the project, but if they were more aware of it, they would be a blocker. This is someone that you need to make sure you engage with so that they don't become an active blocker of the project. And finally, you have the tripwire, someone who doesn't have a lot of power in the organization, someone who is not that interested in the project, but isn't supportive of it. And so you need to understand what their needs are and what their interests are so that you can make sure that you don't cause them to trip up the project. As with the other two-dimensional grids, you can also create a spreadsheet if you like and use some simple formulas and some conditional highlighting in order to map all of these different dimensions to all of these stakeholders and have it automatically calculate what category of stakeholder they are and how best to manage them. And that's it for part one. P. 
PM Ready is a publication of PM Guaranteed and is based on the Project Management Institute's PMBOK Guide.